Chapter 9 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 9 Quote, now all admire in each high flavored dish the capabilities of flesh, fowl, fish. In order due, each guest assumes his station, throbs high his breast with fond anticipation, and prelibates the joys of mastication. Unquote. Helio Gabeliad. The apartment to which Monsieur Le Coy handed Elizabeth communicated with the hall through the door that led under the urn which was supposed to contain the ashes of Dido. The room was spacious and of very just proportions, but in its ornaments and furniture the same delivery of taste and imperfection of execution were to be observed as existed in the hall. Of furniture there were a dozen green wooden armchairs with cushions of marine taken from the same piece as the petticoat of Remarkable. The tables were spread, and their materials and workmanship could not be seen. But they were heavy and of great size. An enormous mirror in a gilt frame hung against the wall, and a cheerful fire of the hard or sugar maple was burning on the hearth. The latter was the first object that struck the attention of the judge, who on beholding it exclaimed rather angrily to Richard, How often I have forbidden the use of sugar maple in my dwelling! The sight of that sap as it exudes with the heat is painful to me, Richard. Really, it behooves the owner of wood so extensive as mine to be cautious what example he sets his people, who are already felling the forest as if no end could be found to their treasures, nor any limits to their extent. If we go on in this way, twenty years hence we shall want fuel. Fuel in these hills, cousin Duke, exclaimed Richard in derision. Fuel? Why, you might as well predict that the fish will die for the want of water in the lake, because I intend, when the frost gets out of the ground, to lead one or two of the spring through logs into the village. But you are always a little wild on such subject, Marmaduke. It's a wilderness returned Judge earnestly, to condemn a practice which devotes these jewels of the forest, these precious gifts of nature, these mines of corn, I fort and wealth to the common uses of a fireplace. But I must and will, the instant the snow is off the earth, send out a party into the mountains to explore for coal. Coal! echoed Richard. Who the devil do you think would dig for coal? When hunting for a bushel, he would have to rip up more of trees than would keep him in fuel for a twelve-month. Puh! Ha! Marmaduke, you should leave the management of these things to me, who have a natural turn that way. It was I that ordered this fire, and a noble one it is, to warm the blood of my pretty cousin Bess. The motive, then, must be your apology, Dick Lawn, said the judge. But, gentlemen, we are waiting. Elizabeth, my child. Take the head of the table. Richard, I see, means to spare me the trouble of carving by sitting opposite to you. To be sure I do, cried Richard. Here is a turkey to carve, and I flatter myself that I understand carving a turkey, or for that matter a goose as well as any man alive. Mr. Grant! Where's Mr. Grant? Will you please say grace, sir? Everything in getting cold. Take a thing from the fire this cold weather, and it will freeze in five minutes. Mr. Grant, we want you to say grace. For what we are about to receive, the Lord make us thankful. Come, sit down, sit down. Do you eat wing or breast, Cousin Bess? But Elizabeth had not taken her seat, nor was she in readiness to receive either the wing or breast. Her laughing eyes were glancing at the arrangements of the table and the quality and selection of the food. The eyes of the father soon met the wondering looks of his daughter, 
and he said with a smile, You perceive, my child, how much we are indebted to Remarkable for her skill in housewifery. She has indeed provided a noble repast, such as well might stop the cravings of hunger. La, said Remarkable, I am glad if the judge is pleased, but I am notional that you'll find the sauce overdone. I thought as Elizabeth was coming home that a body could do no less than make things agreeable. My daughter has now grown to woman's estate, and is from this moment mistress of my house, said the judge. It is proper that all who live with me address her as Miss Temple. Do tell, exclaimed Remarkable, a little aghast. Well, who ever heard of a young woman's being called Miss? If the judge had a wife now, I should not think of calling her anything but Miss Temple, but— Having nothing but a daughter, you will observe that style to her, if you please, in the future, interrupted Marmaduke. As the judge looked seriously displeased, and, at such moments, carried a particularly commanding air with him, the wary housekeeper made no reply, and Mr. Grant, entering the room, the whole party were seated at the table as the arrangements of this repast were much in the prevailing taste of that period and country, we shall endeavor to give a short description of the appearance of the banquet. The table linen was of the most beautiful damask, and the plates and dishes of real china, an article of great luxury in this early period of American commerce. The knives and forks were of exquisitely polished steel, and were set in unclouded ivory. So much, being furnished by the wealth of Marmaduke, was not only comfortable, but even elegant. The contents of the several dishes and their positions, however, were the result of the sole judgment of Remarkable. Before Elizabeth was placed an enormous roasted turkey, and before Richard one boiled, in the center of the table stood a pair of heavy silver casters, surrounded by four dishes, one a fricassee that consisted of gray squirrels, another a fish fried, a third a fish boiled, the last was a venison steak. Between these dishes and the turkey stood, on the one side, a prodigious chine of roasted bear's meat, and on the other, a boiled leg of delicious mutton. Interspersed among this load of meats, was every species of vegetable that the season and country afforded. The four corners were garnished with plates of cake. On one was piled certain curiously twisted and complicated figures called nut cakes. On another were heaps of a black-looking substance, which, receiving its hue from molasses, was properly termed sweet cake, a wonderful favorite in the coterie of Remarkable. A third was filled, to use the language of the housekeeper, with cards of gingerbread, and the last held a plum cake, so called for the number of large raisins that were showing their black heads in a substance of suspiciously similar color. At each corner of the table stood saucers, filled with a thick fluid of somewhat equivocal color and consistence, variegated with small dark lumps of a substance that resembled nothing but itself, which Remarkable termed her sweetmeats. At the side of each plate, which was placed bottom upward, with its knife and fork most accurately crossed over it, stood another of smaller size, containing a motley-looking pie, composed of triangular slices of apple, mince, pumpkin, cranberry, and custard. So arranged as to form an entire whole. Decanters of brandy, rum, gin, and wine, with sundry pitchers of cider, beer, and one hissing vessel of flip, were put wherever an opening would admit their introduction. Notwithstanding the size of the table, there was scarcely a spot where the rich damask could be seen. So crowded were the dishes with their associated bottles, plates, and saucers, the object seemed to be profusion, and it was obtained entirely at the expense of order and elegance. All the guests, 
as well as the judge himself, seemed perfectly familiar with this description of fare, for each one commenced eating with an appetite that promised to do great honor to remarkable taste and skill. What rendered this attention to the repast a little surprising was the fact that both the German and Richard had been summoned from another table to meet the judge. But Major Hartman both ate and drank without any rule when on his excursions, and Mr. Jones invariably made it a point to participate in the business in hand, let it be what it would. The host seemed to think some apology necessary for the warmth he had betrayed on the subject of the firewood, and when the party were comfortably seated and engaged with their knives, he observed, The wastefulness of the settlers with the noble trees of this country is shocking, Monsieur Le Coy, as doubtless you have noticed. I have seen a man fell a pine when he has been in want of fencing stuff, and roll his first cuts into the gap where he left it rot, though its top would have made rails enough to answer his purpose, and its butt would have been sold at Philadelphia market for twenty dollars. "'And how the devil, I beg your pardon, Mr. Grant,' interrupted Richard, "'but how is the poor devil to get his logs to the Philadelphia market, pray? Put them in his pocket? Ha! As you would have a handful of chestnuts or a bunch of chickerberries?' I should like to see you walking up High Street with a pine log in each pocket. Ha! Ha! Cousin Duke, there are trees enough for us all and some to spare. Why, I can hardly tell which way the wind blows when I'm out in the clearings. They are so thick and so tall. I couldn't at all if it wasn't for the clouds, and I happen to know all the points of the compass, as it were by heart. Aye, aye, squire, cried Benjamin who had now entered and taken his place behind the judge's chair, a little aside withal, in order to be ready for any observation like the present. Look aloft, sir, look aloft. The old seamen say that the devil wouldn't make a sailor unless he looked aloft. As for the compass, why, there is no such thing as steering without one. I'm sure I never lose sight of the main top, as I call the squire's lookout on the roof. But I set my compass, do you see, and take the bearings and distance of things, in order to work out my course. If so be that it should be caught up, or the tops of the trees should shut down out of the light of heaven. The steeple of St. Paul's, now that we knave got it on end, is a great help to the navigation of the woods, for by the Lord Harry, as was— It is well, Benjamin, interrupted Marmaduke, observing that his daughter manifested displeasure at the major domo's familiarity but you forget there is a lady in company and the women love to do most of the talking themselves the judge says his true word cried benjamin with one of his discordant laughs now here is mistress remarkable petty bones just take the stopper off her tongue and you'll hear a gabbling worse like than if you should happen to fall to leeward in crossing a french privateer or some such thing mayhap as a dozen monkeys stowed in one bag it were impossible to say how perfect an illustration of the truth of benjamin's assertion the housekeeper would have furnished if she had dared but the judge looked sternly at her and unwilling to incur his resentment yet unable to contain her anger, she threw herself out of the room with a toss of the body that nearly separated her frail form in the center. Richard, said Marmaduke, observing that his displeasure had produced the desired effect, can you inform me of anything concerning the youth who I so unfortunately wounded? I found him on the mountain hunting in company with the leather stocking as if they were of the same family. But there's a manifest difference in their manners. The youth delivers himself in chosen language, such as seldom heard in these hills, and such as occasions great surprise to me. How one so meanly clad, and following so lowly a pursuit, could attain? Mohegan also knew him. Doubtless he is a tenant of Nanny's hut, did you remark the language of the lad, Monsieur Le Coy? Certainment, Monsieur Temple, returned the Frenchman. He did converse in the excellent Anglais. The boy's no miracle, exclaimed Richard. I've known children that were sent to school early talk much better before they were twelve years old. There was Zared Coe, old Nehemiah's son, 
who first settled in the Beaver Dam Meadow. He could write almost as good a hand as myself, and he was fourteen, though it's true I helped to teach him a little in the evenings. But this shooting gentleman ought to be put in the stocks if he ever takes a rein in his hand again. He is the most awkward fellow about a horse I ever met with. I dare say he never drove anything but oxen in his life. There, I think, Dickon, you do the lad injustice, said the judge. He uses much discretion in critical moments. Dost thou not think so, Bess? There was nothing in this question particularly to excite blushes, but Elizabeth started from the reverie into which she had fallen, and colored to her forehead as she answered, to me, dear sir, he appeared extremely skillful, and prompt, and courageous. But perhaps Cousin Richard will say I am as ignorant as the gentleman himself. Gentlemen, echoed Richard, do you call such chaps gentlemen at school, Elizabeth? Every man is a gentleman that knows how to treat a woman with respect and consideration returned the young lady promptly, and a little smartly. "'So much for hesitating to appear before the heiress in his shirt-sleeves,' cried Richard, winking at Monsieur Lacoy, who returned the wink with one eye while he rolled the other, with an expression of sympathy toward the young lady. "'Well, well, to me he seemed anything but a gentleman. I must say, however, for the lad, that he draws a good trigger, and has a true aim. He's good at shooting at a buck, ha, huh, Marmaduke? Richard, said Major Hartman, turning his grave countenance toward the gentleman he addressed with much earnestness. Ter boy is good. He saveth your life and my life and ter life of Egomini Grant and ter life of ter Frenchman and Richard. He shall never want a pet to sleep in, but old Fritz Hartman has a shingle to cover his het meat. "'Well, well, as you please, old gentleman,' returned Mr. Jones, endeavoring to look indifferent. "'Put him into your own stone house, if you will, Major. I dare say the lad never slept in anything better than a bark shanty in his life, unless it was some such hut as the cabin of leather stocking. I prophesy you will soon spoil him. Any one could see how proud he grew in a short time, just because he stood by my horse's heads.' while I turn them into the highway. No, no, my old friend, cried Marmaduke. It shall be my task to provide in some manner for the youth. I owe him a debt of my own, besides the service he has done me through my friends, and yet I anticipate some little trouble in inducing him to accept my services. He showed a marked dislike, I thought, Bess, to my offer of a residence within these walls for life. Really, dear sir, said Elizabeth, projecting her beautiful underlip, I have not studied the gentleman so closely as to read his feelings in his countenance. I thought he might very naturally feel pain from his wound, and therefore pitied him. But, as she spoke, she glanced her eye with suppressed curiosity toward the major domo. I dare say that Benjamin can tell you something about him. He cannot have been the, in the village, and that Benjamin not have seen him often. I, I seen the boy before, said Benjamin, who wanted little encouragement to speak. He has been backing and feeling in the wake of Nanty Bumpo, through the mountains after deer, like a Dutch longboat in tow of an Albany sloop. He carries a good rifle, too, the leather stocking said in my hearing, before Betty Hollister's barroom fire, though later than the Tuesday night that the younger was certain death to the wild beast. If be he can kill the wildcat that has been heard moaning in the lakeside since the hard frost and deep snows have driven the deer to herd, he will be doing the thing that is good. Your wildcat is a bad shipmate, and should be made to cruise out of the track of Christian men. Lives he in the hut of Bumpo? asked Marmaduke, with some interest. Cheek by chow, the Wednesday will be three weeks since he first hove in sight in company with Leatherstocking. They had captured a wolf between them and brought in his scalp for the bounty. 
that Mr. Bumppo has a handy turn with him in taking off a scalp, and there's them in this village who say he iron't the trade by working on Christian men. If so be that there is truth in the saying, and I am commanded along shore here as your honor does, why do you see? I bring him into the gangway for it yet. There's a very pretty post rigged outside of the stocks, and for the matter of a cat I can fit one in my own hands, ay, and use it too, for the one of a better. You are not to credit the idle tales you hear of Natty. He has a kind of natural right to gain a livelihood in these mountains, and if the idlers of the village take it into their heads to annoy him, as they sometimes do, reputed rogues, they shall find him protected by the strong arm of the law. Delightful is better than to lull, said the Major sententiously. That for his rifle, exclaimed Richard, snapping his fingers. Ben is right, and I— He was stopped by the sound of a common ship bell that had been elevated to the belfry of the academy, which now announced by its incessant ringing that the hour for the appointed service had arrived. For this and every other instance of this goodness, I beg pardon, Mr. Grant, Will you please, sir, to return thanks, sir? It is time we should be moving, as we are the only Episcopalians in the neighborhood, that is, I and Benjamin and Elizabeth, for I count half-breeds like Marmadukes as bad as heretics. The divine arose and performed the office meekly and fervently, and the whole party instantly prepared themselves for the church, or rather, academy. End of chapter 9 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in January of 2009. Chapter 10 of the Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10 Quote, And calling sinful man to pray, loud, long, and deep the bell had tolled. Unquote. Scott's Burger. While Richard and Monsieur Le Coy, attended by Benjamin, proceeded to the academy by a footpath through the snow, the judge, his daughter, the divine, and the major took a more circuitous route to the same place by the streets of the village. The moon had risen, and its orb was shedding a flood of light over the dark outline of pines which crowned the eastern mountain. In many climates the sky would have been thought clear and lucid for a noontide. The stars twinkled in the heavens like the last glimmerings of a distant fire, so much were they obscured by the overwhelming radiance of the atmosphere. The rays from the moon, striking upon the smooth white surfaces of the lake and fields, reflecting upward a light that was brightened by the spotless color of the immense bodies of snow that covered the earth. Elizabeth employed herself with reading the signs, one of which appeared over almost every door, while the sleigh moved steadily and at an easy gait along the principal street. Not only new occupations, but names that were strangers to her ears met her gaze at every step they proceeded. The very houses seemed changed. This had been altered by an addition. That had been painted. Another had been erected on the site of an old acquaintance, which had been banished from the earth almost as soon as it made its appearance on it. All were, however, pouring forth their inmates, who uniformly held their way toward the point where the expected exhibition of the conjoint taste of Richard and Benjamin was to be made. After viewing the buildings, which really appeared to some advantage under the bright but mellow light of the moon, our heroine turned her eyes to a scrutiny of the different figures they passed, in search of any form that she knew, but all seemed alike, as muffled in cloaks, hoods, coats, or tippets, they glided along the narrow passes in the snow, which led under the houses, half hid by the bank, 
that had been thrown up by excavating the deep path in which they trod. Once or twice she thought there was a statuary gate that she recollected, but the person who owned it instantly disappeared behind one of those enormous piles of wood that lay before most of the doors. It was only as they turned from the main street into another that intersected it at right angles, and which led directly to the place of meeting, that she recognized a face and a building that she knew. The house stood at one with the principal corners in the village, and by its well trailed doorway, as well as the sign that was swinging with a kind of doleful sound in the blast that occasionally swept down the lake, was clearly one of the most frequented inns in the place. The building was only of one story, but the dormer windows in the roof, the paint, the window shutters, and the cheerful fire that shone through the open door gave it an air of comfort that was not possessed by many of its neighbors. The sign was suspended from a common alehouse post, and represented the figure of a horseman armed with saber and pistols, and surmounted by a bearskin cap with a fiery animal that he bestrode rampant. All these particulars were easily to be seen by the aid of the moon together with a row of somewhat ineligible writing in black paint, but in which Elizabeth, to whom the whole was familiar, read with facility. The Bold Dragoon A man and a woman were issuing from the door of this habitation as the sleigh was passing. The former moved with a stiff military step that was a good deal heightened by a limp in one leg, but the woman advanced with a measure and an air that seemed not particularly regardful of what she might encounter. The light of the moon fell directly upon her full, broad, and red visage, exhibiting her masculine countenance under the mockery of a ruffled cap that was intended to soften the lineaments of features that were by no means squeamish. A small bonnet of black silk and of a slightly formal cut was placed on the back of her head, but so as not to shade her visage in the least. The face, as it encountered the rays of the moon from the east, seemed not unlike sun rising in the west. She advanced with masculine strides to intercept the sleigh, and the judge, directing the namesake of the Grecian king who held the lines to check his horse, the parties were soon near to each other. "'Good luck to ye, and welcome home, Judge," cried the female, with a strong Irish accent. And I'm sure it's not to me that you're always welcome. Sure, and there's Miss Lizzie, and a fine young woman she is grown. What a heartache would she be given the young men now, if there was such a thing as a regiment in the town. Och, but it's idle to talk in such vanities, since the bell is calling us to meeting, just as we shall be called away unexpectedly some day when we are the less calculating. Good evening, Major. Will I make the bowl of gin toddy the night, or is likely ye shall stand in the big house the Christmas Eve, and that very night you're getting here? I am glad to see you, Miss Hollister, returned Elizabeth. I have been trying to find a face that I knew since I left the door of the mansion house, but none have I seen except your own. Your house too, is unaltered, while all the others are so changed that, but for the places where they stand, they would be utter strangers. I observe you also. Keep the dear sign that I saw Cousin Richard paint, and even the name at the bottom, which you may remember you had the disagreement. It is the Berdragunye man, and that name he would have, who never was known by any other, as my husband here, the captain, can testify. He was a pleasure to wait upon, and he was ever the foremost in need. Oh, but he had a sudden end, and it's to be hoped that he was justified by the cause. And it's not Parson Grant there who gainsay that name. Yes, yes, the squire would paint, and so I thought that we might have his face up there and who had so often shared good and evil with us. The eyes is not so large nor so fiery as the captain's own, but the whiskers and the cap is as to pass. Well, well, I'll not keep you in the crowd talking, but we'll droop in tomorrow after service, 
and ask ye how ye do. It's our bounden duty to make the most of this present, and to go to the house which is open to all. So God bless ye, and keep ye from evil. Will I make the gin twitch the night, or no, Major? To this question the German replied very sententiously in the affirmative, and after a few words had passed between the husband of the fiery-faced hostess and the judge, the sleigh moved on. It soon reached the door of the academy where the party alighted and entered the building. In the meantime, Mr. Joan and his two companions, having a much shorter distance to journey, had arrived before the appointed place some minutes sooner than the party in the sleigh. Instead of hastening, into the room in order to enjoy the astonishment of the settlers, Richard placed a hand in either pocket of his surcoat, and affected to walk about in front of the academy, like one to whom the ceremonies were familiar. The villagers proceeded uniformly into the building, with a decorum and gravity that nothing could move on such occasions, but with a haste that was probably a little heightened by curiosity. Those who came in from the adjacent country spent some little time in placing certain blue and white blankets over their horses before they proceeded to indulge their desire to view the interior of the house. Most of these men Richard approached, and inquired after the health and condition of their families. The readiness with which he mentioned the names of even the children showed how very familiarly acquainted he was with their circumstances and the nature of the answers he received proved that he was a general favorite. At length, one of the pedestrians from the village stopped also and fixed an earnest gaze at a new brick edifice that was throwing a long shadow across the fields of snow as it rose with a beautiful gradation of light and shade under the rays of a full moon. In front of the academy was a vacant piece of ground that was intended for a public square, on the side opposite to Mr. Jones, the new and as yet unfinished church of St. Paul's was erected. This edifice had been reared during the preceding summer, by the aid of what was called a subscription, though all or nearly all of the money came from the pockets of the landlord. It had been built under a strong conviction of the necessity of a more seemly place of worship than the long room of the academy, and under an implied agreement that, after its completion, the question should be fairly put to the people that they might decide what denomination it should belong. Of course, this expectation kept alive a strong excitement in some few of the sectaries who were interested in its decision, though but little was said openly on the subject. Had Judge Temple espoused the cause of any particular sect, the question would have been immediately put at rest, for his influence was too powerful to be opposed but he declined interference in the matter, positively refusing to lend even the weight of his name on the side of Richard, who had secretly given an assurance to his diocesan that both the building and the congregation would cheerfully come within the pale of the Protestant Episcopal Church. But when the neutrality of the judge was clearly ascertained, Mr. Jones discovered that he had to contend with a stiff-necked people, his first measure was to go among them and commence a course of reasoning, in order to bring them round to his own way of thinking. They all heard him patiently, and not a man uttered a word in reply in the way of argument, and Richard thought, by the time he had gone through the settlement, the point was conclusively decided in his favor. Willing to strike while the iron was hot, he called a meeting through the newspaper, with a view to decide the question by a vote at once. Not a soul attended, and one of the most anxious afternoons that he had ever known was spent by Richard in a vain discussion with Mrs. Hollister, who strongly contended that the Methodist, her own church, was the best entitled to and most deserving of the possession of the new tabernacle. Richard now perceived that he had been too sanguine, and had followed into the error of all those who ignorantly deal with that wary and sagacious people. He assumed a disguise himself, that is, as well as he knew how, and proceeded step by step to advance his purpose. The task of erecting the building had been unanimously transferred to Mr. Jones and Hiram Doolittle. Together they had built the mansion-house, the academy, and the jail, 
and they alone knew how to plan and rear such a structure as was now required. Early in the days, these architects had made an equitable division of their duties. To the former was assigned the duty of making all the plans, and to the latter the labor of superintending the execution. Availing himself of this advantage, Richard silently determined that the windows should have the Roman arch, the first positive step in effecting his wishes. As the building was made of bricks, he was enabled to conceal his design until the moment arrived for placing the frames. Then, indeed, it became necessary to act. He communicated his wishes to Hiram with great caution, and without the least adverting to the spiritual part of his project, he pressed the point a little warmly on the score of architectural beauty. Hiram heard him patiently and without contradiction, but still Richard was unable to discover the views of his coadjutor on this interesting subject. As the right to plan was duly delegated to Mr. Jones, no direct objection was made in words, but numberless unexpected difficulties arose in the execution. At first there was a scarcity of the right kind of material necessary to form the frames, but this objection was instantly silenced by Richard, running his pencil through two feet their length at one stroke. Then the expense was mentioned, but Richard reminded Hiram that his cousin paid, and that he was treasurer. The last intimation had great weight, and after a silent and protracted but fruitless opposition, the work was suffered to proceed on the original plan. The next difficulty occurred in the steeple, which Richard had modeled after one of the smaller of those spires that adorn the great London cathedral. The imitation was somewhat lame, it is true, the proportions being but indifferently observed, but after much difficulty, Mr. Jones had the satisfaction of seeing an object reared that bore in its outlines a striking resemblance to a vinegar cruet. There was less opposition to this model than to the windows, for the settlers were fond of novelty, and their steeple was without a precedent. Here the labor ceased for the season, and the difficult question of the interior remained for further deliberation. Richard well knew that when he came to propose a reading desk and a chapel he must unmask for these are arrangements known to no church in the country but his own presuming however on the advantages he had already obtained he boldly styled the building st paul's and hiram prudently acquiesced in this appellation making however the slight addition to calling it new st paul's feeling less aversion to a name taken from the English cathedral than from the saint. The pedestrian whom we have already mentioned as pausing to contemplate this edifice was no other than the gentleman so frequently named as Mr. or Squire Doolittle. He was of a tall, gaunt formation with rather sharp features, and a face that expressed formal propriety mingled with low cunning. Richard approached him, followed by Monsieur Lecoy and the major domo. Good evening, squire, said Richard, bobbing his head, but without moving his hands from his pockets. Good evening, squire, echoed Hiram, turning his body in order to turn his head also. A cold night, Mr. Doolittle, a cold night, sir. Coolish, a tedious spell, aunt. What, looking at our church? Ha! It looks well by moonlight. How the tin of the copula disc glistens. I warrant you the dome of the other St. Paul's never shines so in the smoke of London. It's a pretty meeting-house to look on, returned Hiram, and I believe that Monsieur Le Croix and Mr. Penguillon will allow it. Certainty, exclaimed the complacent Frenchman. It is very fine. I thought the Monsieur would say so. The last molasses that we had was excellent good. It isn't likely that you have any more of it on hand. Oh, oui, he, sir, returned Monsieur Le Coy with a slight shrug of his shoulder and trifling grimace. There is more. I feel very habit that you love it. I hope the meat dosit is in good health. Why, so as it be stirring, said Hiram. The squire hasn't finished the plans for the 
inside of this meeting house yet? No, 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 returned Richard, speaking quickly, but making a significant pause between each negative. It requires reflection. There is a great deal of room to fill up, and I am afraid we shall not know how to dispose of it to advantage. There will be a large vacant spot around the pulpit, which I do not mean to place against the wall like a sentry box stuck up on the side of a fort. It's rulable to put the deacon's box under the pulpit, said Hiram, and then, as if he had ventured too much, he added, but there's different fashions in different countries. That there is, cried Benjamin. Now in running down the coast of Spain and Portugal, you may see a nunnery stuck out on every headland, with more steeples and outriggers, but as dog vanes and weathercocks, then you'll find aboard a three-masted schooners, if so be that a well-bit church is wanting. Old England, after all, is the country to go to, after your models and fashion pieces. As to Paul's, though I've never seen it, being that it's a long way up town from Radcliffe Highway and the docks, yet everybody knows that it's the grandest place in the world. Now, I have no opinion, but this here church over there is like one end of its a grumpus is to a whaler, and that's a small difference in bulk. Monsieur Lourclois here has been in foreign parts, and though is not the same as having been at home, he must have seen churches in France, too, and can form a small idea of what a church should be. Now I ask the monsieur to his face if it is not a clever little thing, taking it by and large. It is very a propos of circumstance, said the Frenchman, ver judgment, but it is the Catholic country that they build up, what you call a a a a grand cathedral, the big church. St. Paul, London is very fine, ver belle, ver grand, what you call big, but Monsieur Benpour Noir, ma, is no what more much as Notre Dame. Ha! Monsieur, what is that you say? cried Benjamin. St. Paul's church is not worth so much as a dam? Mayhap you may be thinking, too, that the Royal Billy isn't a good ship as the Billy de Paris? But she would have licked two of her any day, and in all weathers. As Benjamin had assumed a very threatening kind of attitude, flourishing an arm with a bunch at the end that was half as big as Monsieur Le Coy's head, Richard thought it time to interpose his authority. Hush, Benjamin, hush, he said. You both misunderstand, Monsieur Le Coy, and forget yourself. But here comes Mr. Grant, and the service will commence. Let us go in. The Frenchman, who received Benjamin's reply with a well-bred good humor that would not admit any feeling but pity for the other's ignorance, bowed in acquiescence and followed his companion. Hiram and the major domo brought up the rear, the latter grumbling as he entered the building. If so be that the king of France had so much as a house to live in that would lay alongside of Paul's, one might put up with their jaw. It's more than flesh and blood can bear to hear a Frenchman run down an English church in this matter. While, squire, dear little, I've been at the whipping of two men in one day, clean-built snug frigates with standing royals and them new-fashioned cannonades on their quarters such as, if they had only Englishmen aboard them, would have fought the devil. With this ominous word in his mouth, Benjamin entered the church. End of chapter 10 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in January of 2009. Chapter 11 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 11 
quote, and fools who came to scoff remain to pray, unquote, Goldsmith. Notwithstanding the united labors of Richard and Benjamin, the long room was but an extremely inartificial temple. Benches, made in the coarsest manner, and entirely with a view to usefulness, were arranged in rows for the reception of the congregation, while a rough unpainted box was placed against the wall in the center of the length of the apartment as an apology for a pulpit. Something like a reading desk was in front of this rostrum, and a small mahogany table from the mansion house, covered with a spotless damask cloth, stood a little on one side by the way of an altar. Branches of pines and hemlocks were stuck in each of the fissures that offered in the unseasoned and hastily completed woodwork of both the building and its furniture, while festoons and hieroglyphics met the eye in vast profusion along the brown sides of the scratch-coated walls. As the room was only lighted by some ten or fifteen miserable candles, and the windows were without shutters, it would have been but a dreary cheerless place for the solemnities of a Christmas Eve, had not the large fire that was crackling at each end of the apartment given an air of cheerfulness to the scene, by throwing an occasional glare of light through the vistas of bushes and faces. The two sexes were separated by an area in the center of the room, immediately before the pulpit. Amid a few benches lined this space, that were occupied by the principal personages of the village and its vicinity. This distinction was rather a gratuitous concession made by the poor and less polished part of the population than a right claimed by the favorite few. One bench was occupied by the party of Judge Temple, including his daughter, and, with the exception of Dr. Todd, no one else appeared willing to incur the imputation of pride by taking a seat in what was literally the high place of the tabernacle. Richard filled the chair that was placed behind another table in the capacity of clerk, while Benjamin, after heaping sundry logs on the fire, posted himself nigh by, in reserve for any movement that might require cooperation. It would greatly exceed our limits to attempt a description of the congregation, for the dresses were as various as the individuals, some one article of more than usual finery, and perhaps the relic of other days, was to be seen about most of the females, in connection with the coarse attire of the woods. This wore a faded silk that had gone through at least three generations, over coarse woolen black stockings, that a shawl, whose dyes were as numerous as those of the rainbow, over an awkwardly fitting gown of rough brown woman's wear. In short, each one exhibited some favorite article, and all appeared in their best, both men and women, while the groundworks in dress in either sex were the coarse fabrics manufactured within their own dwellings. One man appeared in the dress of a volunteer company of artillery, of which he had been a member in the down countries precisely for no other reason than because it was the best suit he had. Several, particularly of the younger men, displayed pantaloons of blue, edged with red cloth down the seams, part of the equipments of the Templeton Light Infantry, from a little vanity to be seen in boughten clothes. There was also one man in a rifle frock, with its fringes and folds of spotless white, striking a chill to the heart with the idea of its coolness although the thick coat of brown homemade that was concealed beneath preserved a proper degree of warmth. There was a marked uniformity of expression in countenance, especially in that half of the congregation who did not enjoy the advantages of the polish of the village. A sallow skin that indicated nothing but exposure was common to all, as was an air of great decency and attention mingled generally with an expression of shrewdness and in the present instance of active curiosity. Now and then a face and dress were to be seen among the congregation that differed entirely from this description. If pockmarked and floored with gartered legs, and a coat that snugly fitted the person of the wearer, it was surely an English immigrant, who had bent his steps to this retired quarter of the globe. If hard-featured and without color, with high cheekbones, it was a native of Scotland in similar circumstances. 
the short, black-eyed man, with a cast of the swarthy Spaniard in his face, who rose repeatedly to make room for the bells of the village as they entered, was a son of Aaron, who had lately left off his pack and become a stationary trader in Templeton. In short, half the nations in the north of Europe had their representatives in this assembly, though all had closely assimilated themselves to the Americans in dress and appearance, except the Englishmen. He, indeed, not only adhered to his native customs in attire and living, but usually drove his plough among the stumps in the same manner as he had before done on the plains of Norfolk, until dear-bought experience taught him the useful lesson that a sagacious people knew what was suited to their circumstances better than a casual observer or a sojourner who was, perhaps, too much prejudiced to compare and, peradventure, too conceited to learn. Elizabeth soon discovered that she divided the attention of the congregation with Mr. Grant. Timidity, therefore, confined her observation of the appearances which we have described to stolen glances, but, as the stamping feet was now becoming less frequent, and even the coughing and other little preliminaries of a congregation settling themselves down into a reverential attention were ceasing, she felt emboldened to look around her. Gradually all noises diminished, until the suppressed cough denoted that it was necessary to avoid singularity, and the most profound stillness pervaded the apartment. The snapping of the fires as they threw a powerful heat into the room was alone heard, and each face and every eye were turned on the divine. At this moment a heavy stamping of feet was heard in the passage below, as if a newcomer was releasing his limbs from the snow that was necessarily clinging to the legs of a pedestrian. It was succeeded by no audible tread, but directly Mohegan, followed by the leather stocking and the young hunter, made his appearance. Their footsteps would not have been heard as they trod the apartment in their moccasins, but for the silence which prevailed. The Indian moved with great gravity across the floor, and observing a vacant seat next to the judge, he took it in a manner that manifested his sense of his own dignity. Here, drawing his blanket closely around him so as to partly conceal his countenance, he remained during the service immovable but deeply attentive. Natty passed the place that was so frequently taken by his companion, and seated himself on one end of a log that was lying near the fire, where he continued with his rifle standing between his legs, absorbed in reflection, seemingly of no very pleasing nature. The youth found a seat among the congregation, and another silence prevailed. Mr. Grant now arose and commenced his service with the sublime declaration of the human prophet. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. The example of Mr. Jones was unnecessary to teach the congregation to rise. The solemnity of the divine effected this as by magic. After a short pause, Mr. Grant proceeded with the solemn and winning exhortation of his service. Nothing was heard but the deep though affectionate tones of the reader as he went slowly through this exordium, until, something unfortunately striking the mind of Richard as incomplete, he left his place and walked on tiptoe from the room. When the clergyman bent his knees in prayer and confession, the congregation so far imitated his example as to resume their seats whence no succeeding effort of the divine during the evening was able to remove them in a body. Some rose at times, but by far the larger part continued, unbending, observant, it is true, but it was the kind of observation that regarded the ceremony as a spectacle rather than a worship in which they were to participate. Thus deserted by his clerk, Mr. Grant continued to read, but no response was audible. The short and solemn pause that succeeded each petition was made. Still, no voice repeated the eloquent language of the prayer. The lips of Elizabeth moved, but they moved in vain, and, accustomed as she was to the service of the churches of the metropolis, she was beginning to feel the awkwardness of the circumstance most painfully when a soft, low female voice repeated after the priest, We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. 
startled at finding one of her own sex in that place who could rise superior to natural timidity, Miss Temple turned her eyes in the direction of the penitent. She observed a young female on her knees, but a short distance from her, with her meek face humbly bent over her book. The appearance of this stranger, for such she was entirely to Elizabeth, was light and fragile. Her dress was neat and becoming, and her countenance, though pale and slightly agitated, excited deep interest by its sweet and melancholy expression. A second and a third response was made by this juvenile assistant, when the manly sounds of a male voice proceeded from the opposite part of the room. Miss Temple knew the tones of the young hunter instantly, and struggling to overcome her own diffidence, she added her low voice to the number. All this time Benjamin stood thumbing the leaves of a prayer book with great industry, but some unexpected difficulties prevented his finding the place before the divine reached the close of the confession. However, Richard reappeared at the door, and, as he moved lightly across the room, he took up the response in a voice that betrayed no other concern than that of not being heard. In his hand he carried a small open box, with the figures, eight by ten, written in black paint on one of its sides, which, having placed in the pulpit apparently as a footstool for the divine, he returned to his station in time to say sonorously, Amen. The eyes of the congregation very naturally were turned to the windows, as Mr. Jones entered with his singular load, and then, as if accustomed to his general agency, were again bent on the priest in close and curious attention. The long experience of Mr. Grant admirably qualified him to perform his present duty. He well understood the character of his listeners, who were mostly a primitive people in their habits, and who, being a good deal addicted to subtleties and nice distinctions in their religious opinions, viewed the introduction of any such temporal assistance as form into their spiritual worship not only with jealousy, but frequently with disgust. He had acquired much of his knowledge from studying the great book of human nature as it lay open in the world, and knowing how danger it was to contend with ignorance, uniformly endeavored to avoid dictating where his better reason taught him it was the most prudent to attempt to lead. His orthodoxy had no dependence on his cassock. He could pray with fervor and with faith, if circumstances required it, without the assistance of his clerk and he had even been known to preach a most evangelical sermon in the winning manner of native eloquence, without the aid of a cambric handkerchief. In the present instance he yielded, in many places, to the prejudices of his congregation, and when he had ended there was not one of his new hearers who did not think the ceremonies less papal and offensive, and more conformant to his or her own notions of devout worship, than they had been led to expect from the, a service of forms. Richard found in the divine during the evening a most powerful co-operator in his religious schemes. In preaching, Mr. Grant endeavored to steer a middle course between the mystical doctrines of those sublimated creeds which daily involved their professors in the most absurd contradictions, and those fluent roles of moral government which would reduce the Savior to the level of the teacher of a school of ethics. Doctrine it was necessary to preach, for nothing less would have satisfied the disputatious people who were his listeners, and who would have interpreted silence on his part into a tacit acknowledgment of the superficial nature of his creed. We have already said that among the endless variety of religious instructors, the settlers were accustomed to hear every denomination urge its own distinctive precepts, and to have found one different to this interesting subject would have been destructive to his influence. But Mr. Grant so happily blended the universally received opinions of the Christian faith with the dogmas of his own church, that although none were entirely exempt from the influence of his reasons, very few took any alarm at the innovation. When we consider the great diversity of the human character, influenced as it is by education, by opportunity, and by the physical and moral conditions of the creature, my dear hearers, he earnestly concluded, 
it can excite no surprise that creeds so very different in their tendencies should grow out of a religion revealed it is true but whose revelations are obscured by the lapse of ages and whose doctrines were at the fashion of the countries in which they were first promulgated frequently delivered in parables and in a language abounding in metaphors and loaded with figures on points where the learned have in purity of heart been compelled to differ the unlettered will necessarily be at variance but happily for us my brethren the fountain of divine love flows from a source too pure to admit of pollution in its course it extends to those who drink of its vivifying waters the peace of the righteous and life everlasting it endures through all time and it pervades creation if there be mystery in its workings it is the mystery of a divinity with a clear knowledge of the nature the might and the majesty of god there might be conviction but there could be no faith if we are required to believe in doctrines that seem not in conformity with the deductions of human wisdom let us never forget that such is the mandate of of wisdom that is infinite it is sufficient for us that enough is developed to point our path aright and direct our wandering steps to that portal which shall open on the light of an eternal day then indeed it may be humbly hoped that the film which has been spread by the subtleties of earthly arguments will be dissipated by the spiritual light of heaven and that our hour of probation by the aid of divine grace being once passed in triumph will be followed by an eternity of intelligence and endless ages of fruition all that is now obscure shall become plain to our expanded faculties and what our present senses may seem irreconcilable to our limited notions of mercy of justice and of love shall stand irradiated by the light of truth confessedly the suggestions of omniscience and the acts of an all-powerful benevolence what a lesson of humility my brethren might not each of us obtain from a review of his infant hours and the recollection of his juvenile passions how differently do the same acts of parental rigor appear in the eyes of the suffering child and of the chastened man when the sophist would supplant with the wild theories of his worldly wisdom the positive mandates of inspiration let him remember the expansion of his own feeble intellects and pause let him feel the wisdom of god in what is partially concealed as well as that which is revealed in short let him substitute humility for pride of reason let him have faith and live the consideration of this subject is full of consolation my hearers and does not fail to bring with it lessons of humility and of profit that duly improved would both chasten the heart and strengthen the feeble-minded man in his course it is a blessed consolation to be able to lay the misdoubtings of our arrogant nature at the threshold of the dwelling-place of the deity from whence they shall be swept away at that great opening of the portal like the mist of the morning before the rising sun it teaches us a lesson of humility by impressing us with the imperfection of human powers and by warning us of the many weak points where we are open to the attack of the great enemy of our race it proves to us that we are in danger of being weak when our vanity would fain soothe us into the belief that we are most strong it forcibly points out to us the vainglory of intellect and shows us the vast difference between a saving faith and the corollaries of a philosophical theology and it teaches us to reduce our self-examination to the test of good works but good works must be understood the fruits of repentance the chiefest of which is charity not the charity only which causes us to help the needy and comfort the suffering but that feeling of universal philanthropy which by teaching us to love causes to judge with lenity all men striking at the root of self-righteousness 
and warning us to be sparing of our condemnations of others, while our own salvation is not yet secure. The lesson of expediency, my brethren, which I would gather from the consideration of this subject, is most strongly inculcated by humility. On the heading and essential points of our faith, there is but little difference among those classes of Christians who acknowledge the attributes of the Savior, and depend on his mediation. But heresies have polluted every church, and schisms are the fruit of disputation. In order to arrest these dangers, and to ensure the union of his followers, it would seem that Christ had established his visible church, and delegated the ministry. Wise and holy men, the fathers of our religion, have expended their labors in clearing what was revealed from the obscurities of language, and the results of their experience and researches have been embodied in the form of evangelical discipline. That this discipline must be statutory is evident from the view of the weakness of human nature that we have already taken, and that it may be profitable to us and all who listen to its precepts and its liturgy, may God, in his infinite wisdom, grant, and now too, etc. With this ingenious reference to his own forms and ministry, Mr. Grant concluded his discourse. The most profound attention had been paid to the sermon during the whole of its delivery, although the prayers had not been received with so perfect demonstration of respect. This was by no means an intended slight of that liturgy to which the divine alluded, but was the habit of the people who owed their very existence as a distinct nation to the doctrinal character of their ancestors. Sundry looks of private dissatisfaction were exchanged between Hiram and one or two of the leading members of the conference, but the feeling went no further at that time, and the congregation, after receiving the blessing of Mr. Grant, dispersed in silence and with great decorum. End of chapter 11 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania in January of 2009. Chapter 12 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12 Quote, your creeds and dogmas of a learned church may build a fabric fair with moral beauty, but it would seem that the strong hand of God can only raise the devil from the heart. Unquote. Duo. While the congregation was separating, Mr. Grant approached the place where Elizabeth and her father were seated, leading the youthful female whom we have mentioned in the preceding chapter, and presented her as his daughter. Her reception was cordial and frank as the manners of the country, and the value of good society could render it, the two young women feeling instantly that they were necessary to the comfort of each other. The judge, to whom the clergyman's daughter was also a stranger, was pleased to find one who, from habits, sex, and years, could probably contribute largely to the pleasures of his own child during her first privations on her removal from the associations of a city to the solitude of Templeton, while Elizabeth, who had been forcibly struck with the sweetness and devotion of the youthful suppliant, removed the slight embarrassment of the timid stranger by the ease of her own manners. They were at once acquainted and during the ten minutes that the academy was clearing, engagements were made between the young people, not only for the succeeding day, but they would probably have embraced in their arrangements half of the winter, had not the divine interrupted them by saying, Gently, 
Gently, my dear Miss Temple, or you will make my girl too dissipated. You forgot she is my housekeeper, and that my domestic affairs must not remain unattended to. Should Louisa accept of half the kind offers you are so good to make of her? And why should they not be neglected entirely, sir? interrupted Elizabeth. There are but two of you, and certain I am that my father's house will not only contain you both, but will open its doors spontaneously to receive such guests. Society is a good not to be rejected on account of cold forms in this wilderness, sir, and I have often heard my father say that hospitality is not a virtue in a new country, the favor being conferred by the guest. The manner in which Judge Temple exercises its rights would confirm this opinion, but we must not trespass too freely. Doubt not that you will see us often, my child, particularly during the frequent visits that I shall be compelled to make to the distant parts of the country. But to obtain an influence with such a people, he continued, glancing his eyes toward the few who were still lingering, curious observers of the interview, a clergyman must not awaken envy or distrust by dwelling under so splendid a roof as that of Judge Temple. "'You like the roof, then, Mr. Grant,' cried Richard, who had been directing the extinguishment of the fires and other little necessary duties, and who approached in time to hear the close of the divine speech. "'I am glad to find one man of taste at last. Here is Duke, though. Duke is a tolerable judge. He is a very poor carpenter, let me tell him. Well, sir, well, I think we may say, without boasting, that the service was as well performed this evening as you often see, I think quite as well as I ever knew it to be told in old Trinity, that is, if we accept the organ. But there is the schoolmaster leads the psalm with a very good air. I used to lead myself, but lately I have sung nothing but bass. There is a good deal of science to be shown in the bass, and it affords a fine opportunity to show off a full, deep voice. Benjamin, too, sings a good bass, though he is off out in the words. Did you ever hear Benjamin sing the Bay of Biscayo? I believe he gave us part of it this evening, said Marmaduke, laughing. There was now and then a fearful quaver in his voice, and it seems that Mr. Penguilon is like most others who do one thing particularly well. He knows nothing else. He has certainly a wonderful partiality to one tune, and he has a prodigious self-confidence in that one. For he delivers himself like a nor'wester sweeping across the lake. But come, gentlemen, our way is clear, and the sleigh waits. Good evening, Mr. Grant. Good night, young lady. Remember, you dine beneath the Corinthian roof to-morrow with Elizabeth. The party separated. Richard, holding a close dissertation with Mr. Lacoy, as they descended the stairs, on the subject of psalmody, which he closed by a violent eulogium on the air of the Bay of Biscayo, as particularly connected with his friend Benjamin's execution. During the preceding dialogue, Mohegan returned to his seat with his head shrouded in his blanket, as seemingly inattentive to surrounding objects as the departing congregation was itself to the presence of the aged chief. Natty also continued on the log where he had first placed himself, with his head resting on one of his hands, while the other held the rifle, which was thrown carelessly across his lap. His countenance expressed uneasiness, and the occasional unquiet glances that he had thrown around him during the service plainly indicated some unusual causes for unhappiness. His continued seating was, however, out of respect to the Indian chief, to whom he paid the utmost deference on all occasions, although it was mingled with the rough manner of a hunter. The young companion of these two ancient inhabitants of the forest remained also standing before the extinguished brands, probably from an unwillingness to depart without his comrades. The room was now deserted by all but this group, 
the divine, and his daughter. As the party from the mansion house disappeared, John arose, and dropping the blanket from his head, he shook back the mass of black hair from his face, and, approaching Mr. Grant, he extended his hand and said solemnly, Father, I thank you. The words that have been said since the rising moon have gone forward, and the great spirit is glad. What you have told your children, they will remember and be good. He paused a moment, and then elevating himself with the grandeur of an Indian chief, he added, If Chingachgook lives to travel toward the setting sun after his tribe, and the great spirit carries him over the lakes and mountains with the breath of his body, he will tell his people the good talk he has heard, and they will believe him. For who can say that Mohican has ever lied? Let him place his dependence on the goodness of divine mercy, said Mr. Grant, to whom the proud consciousness of the Indian sounded a little heterodox. And it will never desert him. When the heart is filled with love to God, there is no room for sin. But, young man, to you I owe not only an obligation, in common with those you saved this evening on the mountain, but my thanks for your respectable and pious manner in insisting in the service, at a most embarrassing moment. I should be happy to see you sometimes at my dwelling, when perhaps my conservation may strengthen you in the path which you appear to have chosen. It is so unusual to find one of your age and appearance in these woods at all acquainted with our holy liturgy, that it lessens at once the distance between us and I feel that we are no longer strangers. You seem quite at home in the service. I did not perceive that you had even a book, although good Mr. Jones had laid several in different parts of the room. It would be strange if I were ignorant of the service of our church, sir, returned the youth modestly, for I was baptized in its communion, and I have never yet attended public worship elsewhere. For me to use the forms of any other denomination would be as singular as our own have proved to the people here this evening. You give me great pleasure, my dear sir, cried the divine, seizing the other by the hand and shaking it cordially. You will go home with me now. Indeed, you must. My child has yet to thank you for saving my life. I will listen to no apologies. This worthy Indian and your friend there will accompany us. Bless me to think that. He has arrived at manhood in this country without entering a dissenting meeting-house. Footnote. The divines of the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States commonly call other denominations dissenters though there never was an established church in their own country. No, no, interrupted Leatherstocking. I must away to the wigwam. There's work there that mustn't be forgotten for all your churchings and merrymakings. Let the lad go with you and welcome. He is used to keeping company with ministers and talking of such matters. So is old John, who was Christianized by the Moravians about the time of the old war but I am a plain, unlearned man that has served both the king and his country in this day again, the French and savages, but never so much as looked into a book or learnt a letter of scholarship in my born days. I've never seen the use of much indoor work, though I have lived to be partly bald, and in my time have killed two hundred beaver in a season, and that without counting the other game. If you mistrust what I am telling you, you can ask Chinchgotchcook there, for I did it in the heart of the Delaware country, and the old man is knowing to the truth of every word I say. I doubt not, my friend, that you have been both a valiant soldier and skillful hunter in your day, said the divine, but more is wanting to prepare you for that end which approaches. You may have heard the maxim that young men may die, but old men must. 
I am sure I never was so great a fool as to expect to live forever, said Natty, giving one of his silent laughs. No man need do that who trails the savages through the woods, as I have done, and lives for the hot months on the lake streams. I've a strong constitution. I must say that for myself, as it is plain to be seen for I've drunk the Onondaga water a hundred times while I've been watching the deer licks, when the fever and aggie seeds was to be seen in it as plenty as you can see the rattlesnakes on old Crumhorn. But then I never expected to hold out forever, though there's them living who have seen the German flats a wilderness. I am them that's learned and acquainted with religion, too. Though you might look a week now, and not find even the stump of a pine on them, and that's a wood that lasts in the ground the better part of a hundred years after the tree is dead. This is but time, my good friend, returned Mr. Grant, who began to take an interest in the welfare of his new acquaintance. But I would have you prepare for eternity. It is incumbent on you to attend places of worship, as I am pleased to see that you have done this evening. Would it not be heedless in you to start on a day's toil of hard hunting and leave your ramrod and flint behind? It must be a young hand in the woods, interrupted Natty, with another laugh, that didn't know how to dress a rod out of an ash sapling or find a firestone in the mountains. No, no, I never expected to live forever, but I see times be altering in these mountains from what they was thirty years ago, or for that matter ten years. But might makes right, and the law is stronger than an old man, whether he is one that has much laming, or only like me, that is better now at standing at the passes than following the hounds, as I once used to could. Hey-ho! I never knowed preaching come into a settlement, but it made game scarce, and raised the price of gunpowder and that's a thing not as easily made as a ramrod or an Indian flint. The divine, perceiving that he had given his opponent an argument by his own unfortunate selection of a comparison, very prudently relinquished the controversy, although he was fully determined to resume it at a more happy moment. Repeating his request to the young hunter with great earnestness, the youth and Indian consented to accompany him, and his daughter to the dwelling that the care of Mr. Jones had provided for their temporary residence. Leatherstocking persevered in his intention of returning to the hut, and at the door of the building they separated. After following the course of one of the streets of the village a short distance, Mr. Grant, who led the way, turned into a field through a pair of open bars and entered a footpath of but sufficient width to admit one person to walk in at a time. The moon had gained a height that enabled her to throw her rays perpendicularly on the valley, and the distinct shadows of the party flitted along on the banks of the silver snow like the presence of aerial figures gliding to their pointed place of meeting. The night still continued intensely cold, although not a breath of wind was felt. The path was beaten so hard that the gentle female, who made one of the party, moved with ease along its windings, though the frost emitted a low creaking at the impression of even her light footsteps. The clergyman, in his dark dress of broadcloth, with his mild benevolent countenance, occasionally turned toward his companions, expressing that look of subdued care, which was its characteristic, presented the first object in this singular group. Next to him moved the Indian, his hair falling about his face, his head uncovered, and the rest of his form concealed beneath his blanket. As his swarthy visage, with its muscles fixed in rigid composure, was seen under the light of the moon, which struck his face obliquely, he seemed a picture of resigned old age, on whom the storms of winter had beaten in vain for the greater part of a century. But when, in turning his head, the rays fell directly on his dark, fiery eyes, they told a tale of passions unrestrained, and of thoughts free as air. 
the slight person of Miss Grant, which followed next, and which was but too thinly clad for the severity this season, formed a marked contrast to the wild attire and uneasy glances of the Delaware chief, and more than once during the walk the young hunter, himself no insignificant figure in the group, was led to consider the difference in the human form as the face of Mohegan and the gentle countenance of Miss Grant, with eyes that rivaled the soft hue of the sky, met his view at the instant that each turned to throw a glance at the splendid orb which lighted their path. Their way, which led through the fields that lay at some distance in the rear of the houses, was cheered by a conversation that flagged or became animated with the subject. The first to speak was the divine. Really, he said, it is so singular a circumstance to meet with one of your age that has not been induced by idle curiosity to visit any other church than the one in which he has been educated, that I feel strong curiosity to know the history of a life so fortunately regulated. Your education must have been excellent, as indeed is evident from your manners and language. Of which of the states are you a native, Mr. Edwards? For such, I believe, was the name that you gave Judge Temple? Of this. Of this? I was at a loss to conjecture from your dialect, which does not partake particularly of the peculiarities of any country with which I am acquainted. You have, then, resided much in the cities, for no other part of this country is so fortunate as to possess the constant enjoyment of our excellent liturgy. The young hunter smiled as he listened to the divine, while he so clearly betrayed from what part of the country he had come himself, but for reasons probably connected with his present situation, he made no answer. I am delighted to meet with you, my young friend, for I think an ingenious mind, such as I doubt not yours must be, will exhibit all the advantages of a settled doctrine and devout liturgy. You perceive how I was compelled to bend to the humors of my hearers this evening. Good Mr. Jones wished me to read the communion, and, in fact, all the morning service. But happily the canons do not require this of an evening. I would have wearied a new congregation, but to-morrow I propose administering the sacrament. Do you commune, my young friend? I believe not, sir, returned the youth with a little embarrassment, that was not at all diminished by Miss Grant's pausing involuntarily, and turning her eyes on him in surprise. I fear that I am not qualified. I have never yet approached the altar. Neither would I wish to do it while I find so much of the world clinging to my heart. Each must judge for himself, said Mr. Grant, though I should think that a youth who had never been blown about by the wind of false doctrines, and who has enjoyed the advantages of our liturgy for so many years, in its purity, may safely come. Yes, sir, it is a solemn festival, which none should celebrate until there is reason to hope it is not a mockery. I observed this evening, in your manner to Judge Temple, a resentment that bordered on one of the worst of human passions. We will cross this brook on the ice. It must bear us all, I think, in safely. Be careful not to slip, my child. While speaking, he descended a little bank by the path, and crossed one of the small streams that poured their waters into the lake, and turning to see his daughter pass, observed that the youth had advanced and was kindly directing her footsteps. When all were safely over, he moved up the opposite bank and continued his discourse. I was wrong, my dear sir, very wrong to suffer such feelings to rise under any circumstances, and especially in the presence where the evil was not intended. There is good in the talk of my father, said Mohican, stopping short and causing those who were behind to pause also. It is the talk of Minquon. The white man may do as his fathers have told him but the young eagle has the blood of a Delaware chief in his veins. It is red, and the stain it makes can only be washed out with the blood of a mingo. Mr. Grant was surprised by the interruption of the Indian, 
and stopping, faced the speaker. His mild features were confronted to the face and determined looks of the chief, and expressed the horror he had felt at hearing such sentiments from one who professed the religion of his Savior. Raising his hands to a level with his head, he exclaimed, "'John! John! Is this the religion that you have learned from the Moravians? But no, I will not be so uncharitable as to suppose it. They are a pious, a gentle, and a mild people, and could never tolerate these passions. Listen to the language of the Redeemer, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. This is the command of God, John, and without striving to cultivate such feelings, no man can see him. The Indian heard the divine with attention. The unusual fire of his eye gradually softened, and his muscles relaxed into their ordinary composure. But, slightly shaking his head, he motioned with dignity for Mr. Grant to resume his walk, and followed himself in silence. The agitation of the divine caused him to move with unusual rapidity along the deep path, and the Indian, without any apparent exertion, kept an equal pace, but the young hunter observed the female to linger in her steps, until a trifling distance intervened between the two former and the latter. Struck by the circumstance, and not perceiving any new impediment to retard her footstep, the youth made a tender of his assistance. "'You are fatigued, Miss Grant,' he said. "'The snow yields to the foot, and you are unequal to the strides of us men.' Step on the crust, I entreat you, and take the help of my arm. Yonder light is, I believe, the house of your father, but it seems yet at some distance. I am quite equal to the walk, returned a low tremulous voice, but I am startled by the manner of the Indian. Oh, his eye was horrid, as he turned to the moon in speaking to my father. But I forgot, sir, he is your friend and by his language may be your relative, and yet of you I do not feel afraid." The young man stepped on the bank of snow, which firmly sustained his weight, and by a gentle effort induced his companion to follow. Drawing her arm through his own, he lifted his cap from his head, allowing the dark locks to flow in rich curls over his open brow, and walked by her side with an air of conscious pride as if in inviting an examination of his utmost thoughts. Louisa took but a furtive glance at his person, and moved quietly along at a rate that was greatly quickened by the aid of his arm. "'You are but little acquainted with this peculiar people, Miss Grant,' he said, "'or you would know that revenge is a virtue with an Indian. They are taught from infancy upward to believe it a duty never to allow an injury to pass unrevenged, and nothing but the stronger claims of hospitality can guard one against their resentments where they have power. "'Surely, sir,' said Miss Grant, involuntarily withdrawing her arm from his, "'you have not been educated in such unholy sentiments. It might be a sufficient answer to your excellent father to say that I was educated in the church,' he returned. "'But to you I will add that I have been taught deep and practical lessons of forgiveness. I believe that on this subject I have but little cause to reproach myself. It shall be my endeavor that there yet be less.' While speaking, he stopped and stood with his arm again proffered to her assistance. As he ended, she quietly accepted his offer, and they resumed their walk. Mr. Grant and Mohegan had reached the door of the former's residence, and stood waiting near its threshold for the arrival of their young companions. The former was earnestly occupied in endeavoring to correct, by his precepts, the evil propensities that he had discovered in the Indian during their conversation, to which the latter listened in profound but respectful attention. On the arrival of the young hunter and the lady, they entered the building. 
the house stood at some distance from the village, in the center of a field, surrounded by stumps that were peering above the snow, bearing caps of pure white nearly two feet in thickness. Not a tree nor a shrub was nigh it, but the house externally exhibited that cheerless, unfurnished aspect which is so common to the hastily erected dwellings of a new country. The uninviting character of the outside was, however, happily relieved by the exquisite neatness and comfortable warmth within. They entered an apartment that was fitted as a parlor, though the large fireplace, with its culinary arrangements, betrayed the domestic uses to which it was occasionally applied. The bright blaze from the hearth rendered the light that proceeded from the candle Louisa produced unnecessary, for the scanty furniture of the room was easily seen and examined by the former. The floor was covered in the center by a carpet made of rags, a species of manufacture that was then, and yet continues to be, much in use in the interior, while its edges that were exposed to view were of unspotted cleanliness. There was a trifling air of better life in a tea-table and work-stand, as well as an old-fashioned mahogany bookcase, but the chairs, the dining-table, and the rest of the furniture were of the plainest and cheapest construction. Against the walls were hung a few specimens of needlework and drawing, the former executed with great neatness, though of somewhat equivocal merit in their designs, while the latter were strikingly deficient in both. One of the former represented a tomb with a youthful female weeping over it, exhibiting a church with arched windows in the background. On the tomb were the names with the dates of the births and deaths of several individuals, all of whom bore the name of Grant. An extremely cursory glance at this record was sufficient to discover to the young hunter the domestic state of the divine. He there read that he was a widower, and that the innocent and timid maiden, who had been his companion, was the only survivor of six children. The knowledge of the dependence which each of these meek Christians had on the other for happiness threw an additional charm around the gentle but kind attentions which the daughter paid to the father. These observations occurred while the party were seating themselves before the cheerful fire, during which time there was a suspension of discourse. But when each was comfortably arranged, and Louisa, after laying aside a thin coat of faded silk and a gypsy hat that was more becoming to her modest, ingenuous countenance than appropriate to the season, had taken a chair between her father and the youth, the former resumed the conversation. I trust, my young friend, he said, that the education you have received has eradicated most of those revengeful principles which you may have inherited by descent, for I understand from the expressions of John that you have some of the same blood of the Delaware tribe. Do not mistake me, I beg, for it is not color nor lineage that constitutes merit, and I know not that he who claims affinity to the proper owners of this soil has not the best right to tread these hills with the lightest conscience. Mohican turned solemnly to the speaker, and with the peculiarly significant gestures of an Indian he spoke. Father, you are not yet past the summer of life. Your limbs are young. Go to the highest hill and look around you. All that you see from the rising to the setting sun, from the headwaters of the great spring to where the crooked river is hid by the hills, is his. He has Delaware blood, and his right is strong. Footnote. The Susquehanna means crooked river. Hannah or Hannock meant river in many of the native dialects. Thus we find Rappahannock as far south as Virginia. End footnote. But the brother of Mingon is just. He will cut the country into parts as the river cuts the lowlands, and will say to the young eagle, Child of the Delawares, take it, keep it, and be a chief in the land of your fathers. Never! exclaimed the young hunter, with a vehemence that destroyed the rapt attention with which the divine and his daughter were listening to the Indian. The wolf of the forest is not more rapacious for his prey than that man is greedy of gold, and yet his glidings into wealth are subtle 
as the movements of a serpent. Forbear, forbear, my son, forbear, interrupted Mr. Grant. These angry passions must be subdued. The accidental injury you have received from Judge Temple has heightened the sense of your hereditary wrongs. But remember that the one was unintentional, and that the other is the effect of political changes which have in their course greatly lowered the pride of kings and swept mighty nations from the face of the earth. Where now are the Philistines, who so often held the children of Israel bondage, or that city Babylon, which rioted in luxury and vice, and who styled herself the queen of nations, in the drunkenness of her pride? Remember the prayer of our holy litany, where we implore the divine power that it may please thee to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and turn their hearts. The sin of the wrongs which have been done to the natives is shared by Judge Temple only in common with the whole people, and your arm will speedily be restored to its strength. This arm, repeated the youth, pacing the floor in violent agitation, think you, sir, that I believe the man a murderer? Oh, no, he is too wily, too cowardly for such a crime, but let him and his daughter riot in the wealth. A day of retribution will come. No, 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 he continued as he trod the floor more calmly. It is for Mohican to suspect him of an ancient right to injure me. But the trifle is not worth a second thought. He seated himself, and hid his face between his hands as they rested on his knees. It is the hereditary violence of a native's passion, my child, said Mr. Grant, in a low tone to his affrighted daughter who was clinging in terror to his arm. He is mixed with the blood of the Indians, you have heard, and neither the refinements of education nor the advantages of our excellent liturgy have been able entirely to eradicate the evil. But care and time will do much for him yet. Although the divine spoke in a low tone, yet what he uttered was heard by the youth, who raised his head with a smile of indefinite expression, and spoke more calmly. Be not alarmed, Miss Grant, at either the wildness of my manner or that of my dress. I have been carried away by passions that I should struggle to repress. I must attribute it with your father to be the blood in my veins, although I would not impeach my lineage willingly, for it is all that is left me to boast of. Yes! I am proud of my descent from a Delaware chief, who was a warrior that ennobled human nature. O Mohegan was his friend, and will vouch for his virtues. Mr. Grant here took up the discourse, and finding the young man more calm, and the aged chief attentive, he entered into a full and theological discussion of the duty of forgiveness. The conversation lasted more than an hour when the visitors arose, and after exchanging good wishes with their entertainers, they departed. At the door they separated, Mohican taking the direct route to the village, while the youth moved toward the lake. The divine stood at the entrance of his dwelling, regarding the figure of the aged chief, as it glided at an astonishing gait for his years, along the deep path, his black straight hair just visible over the bundle formed by his blanket which was sometimes blended with the snow under the silvery light of the moon. From the rear of the house was a window that overlooked the lake, and here Louisa was found by her father when he entered, gazing intently on the same object in the direction of the eastern mountain. He approached the spot and saw the figure of the young hunter, at the distance of half a mile, walking with prodigious steps across the wide fields of frozen snow that covered the ice, toward the point where he knew the hut, inhabited by the leather stocking, was situated on the margin of the lake, under a rock that was crowned by pines and hemlocks. At the next instant, the wild-looking form entered the shadow, cast from the overhanging trees, and was lost to view. It is marvelous how long the propensities of the savage continue in that remarkable race, said the good divine. But if he perseveres 
as he has commenced, his triumph shall yet be complete. Put me in mind, Louisa, to lend him the homily, against peril of idolatry, at his next visit. Surety, father, you do not think him in danger of relapsing into the worship of his ancestors? No, my child, returned the clergyman, laying his hand affectionately on her flaxen locks and smiling. His white blood would prevent it. But there is such thing as the idolatry of our passions. End of chapter 12 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania In January of 2009